jewelry in late in laden uh, with the with the dress and all kinds of pretty designs that were there uh, of course she borrowed uh, the, the crown for the day and when they were putting it on it broke <laughs> Uh, there's just a few minutes to go, so they got a quick repair job on that. I don't know what mechanic you call when you break a royal crown that's hundreds of years old, but uh, they brought somebody in to do a quick welding job and fix it up for her so she could, uh, she could uh, put her, uh, her crown on for her wedding. Um, in, in our culture, uh, in, in many places, countries in Europe and here in North America, we, we kind of do it backwards from the ancient Oriental culture. And in some Latin cultures, they actually still do it the Jewish way. And the Jewish way is actually the groom is the center of attention. In our weddings, the groom just kind of slides in from the broom closet, you know what I'm saying? He just kind of, he just kind of slips in there and uh, with the preacher, they kind of sleek in off the side, you know, like the, from the janitor's closet. And uh, everybody's waiting. Uh, and then the, open the back doors, and then the, the pretty music starts, you know, the trickling leaves or whatever it is. And, you know, people will walk down the aisle quietly, and there's the seating of the mothers and the grandmothers and the grandfathers and everything. And, and then the flower girl, the maids of honor, and the matron, and they come down the aisle, and the flower girl, and then the ring bearer. And then the music starts, and everybody stands, and, uh, and all eyes, and nobody's even noticed the groom up front, you know, and his, you know, $90 rented tux, you know. He's just kind of standing there, shoes are too tight, and got his hair ready, finally. And, uh, but everybody's focused on the bride in the back. But in the Oriental culture, it was opposite. The bride made herself ready, mind you. She still got prettied up and, uh, and uh, had her wedding garments. Her bridesmaids had their wedding garments. Jesus is going to use wedding feasts and wedding um, processions and wedding um, uh, celebrations in several of his parables that he's going to tell in the culture of his day, because it's something that every village, no matter how big or how small, was, was a regular occurrence. In, in Psalm 45, Psalm 45 is focusing on really on the fulfillment of, um, the, in the second coming, uh, the bride, the church, has made herself wet ready, the bride of Christ. We have the uh, Revelation chapter 19. We have our marriage supper of the Lamb starts in heaven. But then the marriage feast, that seven years, takes place during the tribulation on earth. The Jewish people are being awakened by the tribulation period and the persecution of the Antichrist. And then Jesus comes back with the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ comes back with him on white horses. And then he begins his, his if you would, thousand year reign with the bride of Jehovah, which is the nation of Israel. And that millennial kingdom is that expression of all of the promises going back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then fleshed out through the new covenant of Jeremiah that is made a, the nation is made alive, Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. Uh, all of the Jewish nation, Romans chapter 11, will look upon him whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12, and they'll be born again. A nation will be born in a day. It's possible. It happens at the second coming. This is that song. This is the wedding song. So whether you picture this as the church when Jesus comes back at the rapture and he snatches us up to heaven and we have our rewards at the, the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ, Paul called it, and now we have adorned ourselves, made ourselves ready, and now we are coming in to the king to have our marriage supper, the lamb, as the church. Or whether you see this as a Jewish person at the end of the tribulation period, when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom and to celebrate finally with the Jews in their fulfillment of God's promises. Either way, this is the picture of the Messiah. It's a messianic song. Many people believe that this is probably Solomon because the picture of other kings sending gifts, 
other uh, queens sending gifts. The king of Tyre's daughter is going to come and attend the wedding. She's going to come bringing gifts from the king of Tyre. You remember Hiram, king of Tyre? He donated all of the timber and all of the, a lot of the uh, timber and uh, workmen for the temple and to build Solomon a palace. So a, a lot of people feel that this is during Solomon's day uh, because there's a lot of riches, there's a lot of grandeur. Uh, Spurgeon made the comment that if you can read Psalm 45 and not see the Messiah then you are blind. He says, if you only see Solomon and the Messiah, then you're cross-eyed. And he said, if you primarily see this is the Messiah, then your focus is right. Because he is worshipped, whoever the king, uh, groom is, is worshipped. He's called Lord. He's called God. And Hebrews chapter 1 says, this is the Messiah. So whether it's Solomon and his, his big wedding, some people think it may have been Solomon's wedding to uh, Pharaoh's daughter, where Solomon's entourage and escort go down to get the bride in Egypt. She takes the uh, boat up the Nile River. She comes across the desert, down through the Judean desert, and comes up the highway and makes her way into Jerusalem, and we have the wedding now. But if this is an earthly picture, and it could be possibly, at some point we see that this is a love song. Matter of fact, look at Psalm 45 at the introduction. You see that little small tiny writing under chapter 40, Psalm 45? Depending on what kind of study Bible you have, most of you should have the introduction. It says, to the chief musician upon Shashnanim. All right? Shashanim. If I mispronounced that correctly. Shashnim is the word for lily. It's, it's the word for lily. Some people think that it was, it was lilies that decorated the, you know how we decorate our aisles with flowers sometimes, okay? That the, it was time to get the lilies out for this wedding, okay? So when you sing this at the temple, put some lilies out to remember ahead, to remember behind at Solomon's wedding, and to look ahead when Messiah is going to marry us. So it has something to do with lilies. Some people, musicians, think that this was an ancient uh, six-stringed instrument, okay? Uh, do you remember when Solomon, uh, when he built his palace and the temple, he had at some of the top of the pillars, he had lilies around them. So do you remember Jesus the Messiah as the lily of the valley? Okay, the bride of morning star. All right, so it's, a, it's a, to the chief musician. So this psalm is going to be written, and he's going to say, you take this to the head musician in the whole kingdom. Take it to the music pastor. We want this song. To the chief musician, for the sons of Korah. I want you to give it to the choir. And it says, maskil. Maskil means that this is kind of to be sung in a teaching tone. In other words, this is, this is not just a worship psalm. It's an instructive psalm that's going to teach you some things about God. It says, and notice that last phrase there in this introduction section, a song of loves. <laughs> a song of loves. God blessed my heart with this psalm in my devotions the other day, and I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts with you. This is a, the, the newspaper clipping of Princess Diana and um, Prince Charles when, when they got married there. But uh, we're going to look at the majesty of the groom and his glory. Psalm 45 focuses on how great the king is on his wedding day. How great the king is on his wedding day. And then the last part of the psalm focuses on the bride and how excited and what her response should be to the king on his wedding day. Of course, it's her wedding day too. But again, the culture is, you know, it's a little hard for us to take in North America that the focus is on the groom. But this, this, is, this is the way theologically it should be, and we benefit when we, when we see it that way. I just want to look at a couple of things. Look at the excitement over the king. Verse number one, look at the excitement over the king. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. 
I mean, he's so excited, he can't wait. Did you ever have something that, that happened and you're like, oh, I got to text this. I just got to text this. You, you, you get a picture or a selfie or, you, or whatever it is, and you're like, oh, I got to send this email out. I got to tell. I got to call him right now. That's the way the author is. Now, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is going to record this in the way that he wants to. But the author is excited about the king. He says, my heart is indicting a good matter. You know, you know, bad news has a tendency to travel fast. <laughs> Sometimes, my, my wife has certain times she likes to listen to the news. She likes to listen to it while she's getting up and getting her coffee going and her getting her, cooking her egg and getting her coffee. And she likes to listen to it while she's making supper. And I, to me, it sounds the same in the evening as it did in the morning. Just the same bad news, it's just 12 hours later, right? You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but, but good news, he says, I, got, have some good, I have a good matter. <laughs> and it says, my heart is indicting on a good matter. The word indicting has the idea of, of bubbling over. Do you ever, you ever shake a, a pop and then open it? That's his heart. His heart has been shaken by, by his love for God. And he's got this tune in his mind. And he's got this song in his heart. And he's got to write it down. He has to write it. His heart is about to explode Jesus while he was on earth. I mean, you go into the four Gospels in the New Testament, most of the time in your Bible, in English, we have it, it's in red. That's just the, the printer's way of showing you sections where Jesus directly is, is speaking and being quoted as saying something. And that, that's, that's what he's saying. He says, every time you talk, you say something wise. Every time you speak, it's with God's grace. Every time you get, and even when you speak of judgment, it, it's, it's backed by, the, by the, the justice of God's goodness. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore, God hath blessed thee forever. God is going to reward the king because he's just such a great orator. I believe it was uh, Queen Elizabeth's father who had a hard time stuttering when he became king. And he had to hire a, a speech therapist to help him because he, had to, uh, he was king now. His brother had abdicated and now he's king and he had to start giving speeches. And he, he had a hard time giving his speeches over the radio. Jesus Christ, grace came out of his preaching and his teaching and his conversation with children and women and sick people and poor and rich and religious and pagan. God's grace constantly being spoken of. And he says, you know what? You're, 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 all that grace coming out of your mouth, that righteousness, God's going to reward you. You're going to live forever. This grace forever. And it's just kind of a celebration here. God hath blessed forever. He's never going never gonna to run out of good things to say. He's admiring him. And then you have not only the excitement over the king, but there's the arrival of the king. He kind of he kinda, kinda is, is excited about it. He says in verse number three, Gird on thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. He speaks of the gallantry of the king as the groom where he girds his sword on. I like what one author said about the Messiah. His first battle was at Calvary at Golgotha, the place of the skull. At Calvary, he purchased the people that will be in his kingdom. The next battle, when Jesus comes back at the battle, is the battle of Armageddon. It will be in Megiddo. And at that battle, he's going to purchase their property. He's going to get their property back. Of course, we're all saved by the blood of Christ. We're all saved by faith. He says, gird on thy sword. It, many times they would wear a belt around their shoulder that would hang down by their thigh on their side. So their sword would come and their sword would hang down on their thigh by their side. And, and then they would take it and they would put it on the horse, on the saddle, so that it would be there. They didn't normally strap it around like a belt, but uh, it really is pointless. The idea is, is, he says, gird on thy sword. When they would, there are four, if you go in Britain, they have four swords on display. Two of them are from, one, uh, one of them is the sword of mercy. Uh, there, there was a general who was about to slay someone 
and he decided not to kill them. And so they call that the sword of mercy. And then they have two swords of justice that they have. And then they had a fourth sword. It's a rather large one. And when the king is having his coronation or the queen is having her coronation, that's the big sword that they actually get out and have. And it's the sword of the law. And, and this sword that the Messiah has, he says, gird it on. It's, it's, it's an official, it's wedding day. And the picture here is of his gallantry. And then he says, you're mighty. You're the most mighty one. And the idea is, is of strength. And then he says, you have majesty. You have glory. And then he emphasizes his victory. Look what he says in verse number three. Gird on thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty, ride prosperously. You're not going to be on the coal, on the foal of a donkey a colt, the foal of a donkey, it, anymore. You're going to be on a white horse. And that's the picture here, is riding prosperously. You're not coming humbly anymore. And your majesty he says, because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. There is the picture here of his, his victory at, of his righteousness but is truthfully it's interesting it's because of his meekness and righteousness his truth and meekness and righteousness that he is victorious he says ride in majesty prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness well, one author put it like this, I believe it was John Phillips, he called it, because of your honesty, because of your humility, because of your holiness, you can ride in victory. He has a, he has a spotless record. He, he's blameless, he's sinless. There's nobody that can shake a fist at him justly. And then there's the appearance of the king. In verse 6, he kind of unpacks what it looks like. It says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's very interesting. He talks about the royal throne here. This is why this really can't be talking about Solomon anymore. Because he calls the bridegroom and the king God. As a matter of fact, keep your finger here and go to Hebrews chapter 1. I want to show you. What the author of Hebrews takes Psalm 45 and he weaves a, a theology, he weaves a doctrine that Jesus, the Messiah, is better than angels. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 7. He's talking about how Jesus is better than angels. And he said, of the angels, he saith, make his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Hebrews 1, verse number 8. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So he, he's, he's trying to help you understand that no matter what you've heard about angels and be how great and strong they are and can kill 185,000 Syrian uh, uh, soldiers in one night and, and how they can fly from the beginning of Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9 and 10. He flies from heaven all across the galaxies and the universe and is standing there by the time Daniel's done praying. That's super, super light speeds going on there to fly the entire universe. As much as you think and know about angels, Jesus is far greater than angels, he's saying, because he never said to an angel that you are God. He said, which of the angels did he say, O oh God, your throne is forever and ever and ever. Go back to Psalm 45. This is, the, this, is, this is talking about the Messiah. And if you understand the doctrine of the Trinity, you're not confused here. You understand that Jesus is God, God the Father is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. You understand that in the Trinity, that, that God could speak to God. He's always existed. He didn't create this universe because he was lonely. He had the Trinity. He had eternal relationship. He had eternal love. 
And that's the picture that's here, is this appearance of the king in his royal throne. And it's forever and ever. It's interesting. Let me take a drink here. It's interesting in Revelation, that phrase forever and ever is used repeatedly. Revelation chapter 1, about Jesus' kingdom, forever and ever. Revelation chapter 6, it talks about forever and ever. It ends in Revelation chapter 22, forever and ever. It's, it's a great thing to see his royal throne. And in his ruling scepter, he's, he talks about his scepter. That's his ruling aspect. He's, he has a throne, and the scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. There's nothing he's going to do when he rules that's going to be bad. He won't allow any evil. He won't make any bad calls. Can you think of maybe some bad calls that some prime ministers, premiers, maybe you would disagree with in the past three years with COVID and everything? He will never make a bad call. It will always be done in rightness. There'll never be any uh, favoritism. There'll never be any injustices. There'll never be any manipulation. There'll never be taking advantage of weak people. There'll never be any corruption. It's, a, it's refreshing. His ruling scepter is a reference to Psalm 2 where he's already set his king upon his holy hill in Zion. And that's the king's appearance. And notice the king's attitude. Notice his attitude in verse number 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Now, you and I don't get to define in this universe what's good and what's bad morally. God decides that. He is immutable. He doesn't change. And he loves good things in God's eyes. He loves it. He loves truth. He loves righteousness. He loves mercy. He loves kindness. He loves joy. He loves peace. He loves long-suffering. He loves gentleness. He loves goodness. He loves meekness. He loves temperance. Against such, there's no law. Not God's law. But thou hatest wickedness. We need to, the author said, that we need to love what God loves and hate what God hates. There are going to be, as peaceful as we are as Canadians, there are going to be some things that we should not like. And we need, the more we get in the Word of God, the more we get a Christian worldview, in the Christian worldview, we allow the Word of God to begin teaching our mind and our flesh. We could die to the flesh. You can't teach the flesh. You die to it. But we renew our mind. We learn to say yes to the spirit and to love good things in God's definition of righteousness and to hate wickedness, which is sin against God or, or stealing God's glory. He says, therefore, God, thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. True joy, according to the, the God, the Father and the Holy Spirit in this text is like an ointment. It's not trickled, all right? You ever, you ever see, you know, you think of Samuel coming to anoint David, you know, and he just kind of has this little bottle of olive oil and he just kind of goes. No, friend, they took the jar, all right? And it flowed down. When they anointed Aaron to be the high priest, uh, Psalm 133, I believe it says, it ran, the oil ran down his head, on his beard, down his shirt, and it just drenched the guy with oil anointing him. That's how happiness, the Spirit of God poured joy and happiness on the Messiah. Now, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but he had true peace and joy. Jesus wasn't depressed. He was Overcome with grief at times because of the sin of the world and the price he would pay for sin of being separated from his father. But Jesus had joy. And he says, I've come to give you life and more abundantly. Joy unspeakable and full of glory, Paul's going to say. Well, the more we learn to love righteousness and hate iniquity, the more the Spirit of God releases that peaceful joy, oil of gladness. And the, he... he describes this aroma of the king. He says in verse number 8, all thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. 
out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. It's just everybody's happy at this wedding for Jesus. Everybody's excited. And even Brother Steve's is going to not have allergies in his glorified body. He's going to be able to handle this myrrh and aloes and casea in heaven. Amen. It's, it's going to smell good. And it's not going to bother you. It's gonna, he's coming out of the ivory palaces. Solomon had a throne made of ivory. Now, this is ancient of days, all right? This is a thousand years before Christ. Ivory was rare. I remember Don Moore, Margie Moore telling about uh, they hired a man to come in and fix their piano one time, and uh, he took all of the ivory off the keys. Uh, ivory is rare. Okay, so you got to get it off the uh, you know, the tusk of an elephant, or you've got to get it from other tusks. So the picture is that this palace is full of ivory. Now God doesn't have to take it off an elephant; He can just create it. So He's got a whole palace up in heaven, and it's it's He as He comes through, He has this be- these garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Myrrh and cassia were the two scents that they use in Exodus chapter 30 and 33 for, the hot, for anointing things in the tabernacle. It was a mixture, a certain type of mixture that they weren't supposed to sell in the marketplace for the Jews. It was supposed, this particular mixture was supposed to be just be reserved, and that's the scent in heaven, apparently. That's the aura, the aroma and the attendant to the king in verse number nine, the king's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of earth ophir. So all of these verses have been about the groom. They've all been about the groom. So can I just read these last verses in closing as application? How much you and I should love Jesus. I almost had the pianist play that song tonight. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. That's the song that, that I, rings in my mind when I come to these last few verses. Because the, the author's been so excited about this wedding taking place finally. And the king, he's so lovely, he smells so good, and he's so strong, and he's so just, and he's so, so clean. He's so safe. He's my king. And so he starts to speak now to the bride. If it's your church, then that's us. Hearken, O daughter, and consider, incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. See, there's a decision that the bride had to make if she was going to marry Solomon. You can't live in Egypt and marry King Solomon in Jerusalem. <laughs> you got uh, the principles in Genesis 2, leave and what? Cleave. You got to leave Egypt and you got to move to Jerusalem. And, and Solomon's going to build her a palace, all right, in Jerusalem. She's a Gentile, so he's, he's going to have her kind of off in her own little, little palace there. Um, not so in heaven. We're going to live with him in his palace but there he says hearken and listen and consider and incline your ear and he's going to say you're going to have to forget your past that old family you came from you're going to have to dedicate yourself from now on to this king i mean in in christian terms we would say you're going to have to convert you're going to have to leave the world behind my dad sent me an email this week about the history of the song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. In the 1840s, there were two revivals that were taking place. There was a Welsh revival over in Europe, and there was a Baptist revival in North America in the 13 colonies, in the 1840s and 50s. Both of these revivals, the Welsh revival and the Baptist revival in the 13 colonies in the U.S., Adoniram Judson, sent missionaries to Burma and India, right there on the border. And from those missionaries and the revivals that were taking place, people started getting saved, and they started sending missionaries out. And across the border from Burma, which today is Myanmar, 
was India and the particular villages. Now these villages were known to be very hostile to outsiders. And one of the stories, some people think there's a Baptist history story that started this, and some people think it was the Welts revival that started us. I think it was both. But if you look at the history, there was a Christian man who converted in one of the villages, and he was sharing his faith. His wife got saved, and his two boys, I believe, got saved, and the chief gathered the village together and this family, and they arrested them, you could say, and they wanted the man to recant, to deny Jesus, this Jesus that they had heard about, and to go back to the old ways. They worshiped spirits and a, a type of Hinduism. And he would not. He wouldn't recant. He says, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And so they killed, with arrows, they, they killed his two boys. And he said... We're going to kill your wife if you do not recant. He said, I, I can't. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And then they shot his wife and killed his wife with arrows. And they said, we're going to kill you if you do not recant and stop following this Jesus. He said, uh, the world's behind me. The cross is before me. There's no turning back. And then they killed him. And the tradition says that the boldness of this man to decide to follow Jesus and not recant, not turn back, that the, it broke the heart of the chief. And the chief converted on the spot to Jesus, and therefore the whole village eventually got saved. And these two revivals, the Welsh revival and the Baptist revival, brought them back through their converts and the churches that were being started in India to Australia, and then back to uh, Britain, and then back to the United States. In the 1940s, 100 years later, they were being used in revival crusades all over the world. I have decided to follow Jesus. And that's what the author is saying. This king is a great king, and you've got to decide if you're going to leave this and follow this king. So hear, O daughter, consider and incline thy ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So shall thy king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. I mean, this is, the king's going to desire thy beauty. I mean, there's, there's a desire for the bride. There's a delight in the bridesmaids. The daughter of Tyre shall be with her, there with her gift, verse 12. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. Even back then, they had uh, bridal showers, apparently. And you brought gifts to the wedding. Because here is the uh, king's daughter. Here is the daughter of the king of Tyre who's bringing some gifts and lots of other people bringing gifts. So I think it's a good tradition even today. Verse 13, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is wrought of gold. She shall be brought to the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Now, I want you to notice something. In this culture, in verse 16, talks about her duty as the queen. Verse 16, instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all of the earth. The queen's privilege was to bear the king children that would be part of his kingdom and help him rule over the whole planet. You see that? That's our goal as the church. Why has he left the church here? If he is our king and we have married him at salvation, why are we still here? What brings him glory? It brings him glory when we bear fruit. When we recruit some more sons and daughters of the king to be part of his kingdom and rule and reign with him for a thousand years and on and do forever. You see the picture here? This is, where, this is the portion of my devotions where I'm like, oh, wow, I'm going to give this on Wednesday night. The two portions of this passage where it says that you're going to have to forget your own people and your father's house and follow this king. 
and now we were supposed to, instead of your fathers and your focus being on your heritage, now your focus isn't on replenishing the king's heritage. We wanted some people to be born again and to be regenerated. Now they're transferred from the kingdom of darkness, Colossians says, into the kingdom of his dear son. We are promoting the kingdom every time somebody's born again. Because they become part of a citizen of on high. Philippians is going to say, your citizenship is on high. That's the excitement that's here. One author used an illustration at this particular point in reference to the church. That Napoleon, when he was, had a meeting with his generals and put out a map of the world when he was about to conquer the world. I forgot to flip my, my focus here. Her Majesty, the Bride, and Her Gown. That's what I was, we were looking at the last half. But it said Napoleon went over to the map of the whole world and he took a, a mark, marker and he marked a circle on the map. And he said, this is a sleeping giant. We're going to leave them alone. But we're going to conquer the rest of Europe and into parts of Asia. And he was just kind of, he made his plans. Napoleon did. The circle that he drew around and said, this is a sleeping giant. We're going to leave them alone. We're going to let them sleep, he said, was China. He did not want to attack China. They had a large army. And the author of Psalm, one of the uh, commentators in Psalm 45 says, sometimes that's Satan's tactic today. Of all of the people on the planet, if he could draw a circle around some churches and some Christians and say, just let them sleep. Just let them sleep. I'm not going to attack them. I'm not going to bombard them. I'm just going to let them sleep. Just, just let them enjoy the blessings. Their own life, their own family, their own focus, their own world. They're not passionate for the king. They're not making a difference. They're not multiplying themselves and recruiting more sons for the kingdom. Just let them sleep. May by God's grace our passion boil in our hearts for Jesus. And that we long to share our faith and to see his fame spread abroad, which is the last verse in the text. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your beauty of this wedding psalm, 45. Thank you for the theology that's behind it about Jesus being God and the Trinity and the deity of Christ in the book of Hebrews that he's better than angels and he's better than priests and better than Moses and better than Aaron. What a great wedding day. We long for the rapture, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're, you're going to be so handsome. You're going to be so royal in your, your, your gallantry with your sword at your side and coming out of the ivory palaces with those beautiful pillars and the smell that's going to just seem so sweet after the corruption of this planet and this rotten world. It's going to be so refreshing. Until then, would you ignite our hearts of flame? to love Jesus and spread his good news, that our tongues would be the witness of a ready writer, that our hearts would be indicting this good news and the good matter of Jesus, our King. And may we as your bride live out the righteousness that you've given to us. Help us with this in Jesus' name, amen. You should have a prayer sheet list there tonight. Um.